<coughs> we're going to get started here for the start of our media availabilities here this afternoon at Darlington Raceway to officially kick off throwback weekend. We've now been joined by Justin Algar, driver of the number seven Hellman Chevrolet for Junior Motorsports. Justin, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, before we roll um, straight to questions for Justin, um, another Great finish last weekend in some ways, but I know a heartbreaker in some ways as well, knowing you had such a strong run at Dover. Um, talk to us a little bit about just connecting with your team post-Dover and then how you guys will approach this weekend here in Darlington. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from a team standpoint, you know, last week for our seven team was obviously a heartbreaker for how it kind of ended. But on the other side of it, I mean, to, to lead as many laps as we did to run up front like we did, to get all four of our cars in the top five, I mean, realistically, that's um, – that's a feat we talk about a lot internally at our shop of, of, you know, having fast race cars and coulda, woulda, shouldas of, you know, being in that position, but very rarely does it actually work out that way. So really proud of our team. You know, it's interesting because in the time that I've been at junior motorsports, you know, you, you kind of have the ebbs and flows of, of where you feel like you stack up compared to everybody. And, um, this year especially, but, but these last handful of races, we, we just feel like we're doing a really good job of, of managing the, the race weekends and, and bringing cars that are fast. And I think if you keep bringing those same fast cars, you keep putting yourself in those positions, it eventually works out for you. And I know our seven team, um, they deserve a win. They, they've, they've, they've put the effort and the time in, uh, but that's not always a guarantee. So last week, um, you know, to come home second, to have a good, good finish was good, uh, to have an opportunity to go for three, three straight, uh, as, as a company is obviously a lot of fun for this week and a lot of, uh, I mean, emphasis on coming here and doing the best we can, but obviously we want to win. But um, I think the, the biggest thing is just keep the momentum going because it's, it's really easy to stop the momentum. It's really hard to, to kind of generate it back. So I feel like our team's doing a really good job of, you know, firing on all eight cylinders at the moment. All right. We'll now go to the media for questions. If you have a question for Justin, go ahead and raise your hand. And we'll start here in the back with Steve Post. Steve Post Motor Racing Network. Justin, the dynamic of you four drivers at Junior Motorsports. You're the veteran. You've got a really young kid with, uh, uh, you know, over there with Sam. You've got a new veteran, if you will, with Josh. And then you've got a guy that's somewhere in the middle with Noah. What's that dynamic like as far as practice, team meetings, you guys working together, not working together? What's that dynamic like? Very different. Um, you know, I think it, it's, it's, it's really neat when you look at the landscape of our sport, right? It's not just JRM that's kind of dealing with this. You, you've got a group of um, veterans that, that obviously have been around for a long time, whether that be on the Cup Series side or the Xfinity Series side or Truck Series side. Um, you've had a huge influx of young talent that's coming through. And then you've got you know a, a huge range of kind of everywhere in the middle. And, and you take a guy like Josh Berry, who arguably is one of the best short track racers in the country, um, without that opportunity to, to come race NASCAR, does he get the uh, number one? I know he doesn't get the opportunity to do it, but number two, does he does he get the credit that he deserves for his talent? Right. And I think that's the one thing I look at is short tracks all across the country. You know, every Friday, Saturday night, or nowadays it's Monday through Sunday, any day of the week they race on. But um, there's so many racers that are coming through that have either they're up and coming or they've been there for a while that have an immense amount of talent. Um, that all being said, what's interesting about our shop is. Not only do you have an eclectic group of drivers, but you have an eclectic group of, of personnel, right? People that work on the cars, the crew chiefs, the engineers, um, all are at different levels of their career, right? Some are still trying to get to that point of, of you know, making it in their career and they're, they're coming from the bottom and kind of going up through. You've got some guys that have been around the sport for a long time that have settled into a home where they really enjoy. And it's so interesting because even as good as all four of our cars run on a regular basis we leave the, we leave to go to the racetrack considerably different we all seem to fight different things in the race i mean last week uh we all four fought something different in the race and still all four ran really well and i, I think that's just a testament to the quality of parts that we're that we're bringing to the racetrack um but i think it also goes to when you look at the people that are in place with each team there's a, a lot of th there's there's just a lot of cohesiveness amongst each group, right? So our seven team really fits well together. The one team really fits well together. Seven, eight, you know, and nine. You know, like it just, it just seems to work out really well. And I, and I'm really proud of our team and where we're at. So, um, as different as it is, and and as uh, I've had to learn a lot of new lingo. I'll, I'll I will say that between Sam and Noah, uh, the 
their vocabulary is considerably different than mine. Um, Josh and I, I feel like we're a little bit older, so maybe we kind of grew up in the same time frame, but um, it has definitely been interesting changing the lingo around a little bit. All right, we're going to come up front to Bob Pockers here on the front row. Uh, Bob Pockers, Fox Sports. You talk about the cohesiveness of your team, but your pick changes fairly often as it's, you know, you guys just take who you get from Hendrick. So I'm curious, you know, when stuff like what happens last week, do you, I mean, do you try to talk to any of those guys? Do you have relationships with them? How, and maybe how do you advise some of your other kind of the other younger drivers on your team on how to maybe handle these situations? Well, I, I think there's a lot that goes into this. Number one, I've, I've been lucky enough to be around the, the Hendrick pit crew organization for, for a number of years. And, and, even before I was at, at JRM, I've, I've been around the Hendrick pit crew, whether that be on the 51 Cup Series side or, or um, you know, when I was at 31 in, in, a, in the Xfinity Series. One thing for me is people are people, right? And 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 what makes this sport go around is the people. No, no different than all of your faces sitting in this room. Our media doesn't operate without the people that are that are involved in it, right? And that's what makes our, our sport so awesome and makes it what it is. And the, and the pit crew guys are the same way. I, I have a great relationship with uh, majority of the pit crew members from, from Hendrick Motorsports um, outside of the racetrack, not just, you know, at track. And, you know, last week was interesting because, number one, last week we ended up having a failure, right? They, ultimately, the gun wouldn't switch directions, and that's what caused our, our final um, bit stop issue. But even furthermore, um, you know, my rear changer, as soon as the race was over, he came and found me. And, and you can see the level of, of not only frustration on his part, that it didn't go well, but, but disappointment, you know, he doesn't want to be the guy that, that, you know, took us from up front to, to, you know, being mired back in traffic, which we got lucky and got a great restart and was able to get back up there really quickly. But, but, you know, ultimately it could have been a lot different, <clears throat> but having that conversation with him, I, I, I basically told him in that moment, and I've always kind of felt this way is, you know, mistakes happen, whether you're on the pit crew, whether you're a crew member, whether you're a driver, um, now, if they happen multiple times over and over again, and it's the same mistake, then obviously that that doesn't become a mistake anymore. That becomes a problem. But but when you have kind of those one-offs, um, you know, nobody nobody intends to make a mistake at anything in life, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't go get in your personal vehicle and back into somebody and say, "Oh man, I wanted to make that mistake," right? It's no different than with a pit crew. And and so, you know, as as disappointing as it can be sometimes, I think. You know, because of the relationship that I have with those guys and the ability to have those those conversations, um, it's no different than drivers or or crew chiefs, whatever. You know, if you're willing to have those conversations and 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 really um, try to stay on really good terms, um, when you have mistakes like that, y you roll with it, right? Especially when you get to the bottom of it, you know why it happened. That makes it even that makes it even build that that relationship stronger. So for me, it's always been about relationships with people and as disappointing as it is mistakes happen and we just got to make sure that if we're having that same mistake over and over again we got to fix it but at this point right now it's been kind of isolated challenges and um that's not even just with our team i mean here you look at the cup series side i mean you got guys that are what i would consider a plus level pit crew members that are having that are having trouble on xfinity series side on cup series side i'm, I'm assuming they're having the same issues on the truck series side and and nobody nobody wants to be in that position so those guys are working their butts off and and it's appreciated um when you have a great stop because you can you can definitely know the difference between a good stop and a bad stop all right we're going to go to pete and then we'll come up front to mike all right go ahead pete pete yacobelli associated press uh justin this is supposed to be a place where young guys are supposed to struggle for a few years but you came here right out of the bat and you know, and and did well. What is it about this place that suited you right from the start? <laughs> year one was great. Year two was absolutely atrocious. But then after that, I've I've refallen back in love with it. Um, you know, I, I've never understood why they say you're supposed to run bad here to begin with. Um, but this place is so unique, right? It is so different from everywhere else we go. And I think too, it depends on your driving style. You know, a lot of times when you're younger. You have a lot more aggressive style and, 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 you know, this place, I don't know that I've ever seen it benefit the aggressive nature of, of a driving style, right? I mean, uh, I'm sure at some point in time it has, um, 
but for the most part, I feel like the drivers that are kind of um, let things come to you type racers, this is probably a better place for you. So I feel like that's part of it. You know, I've, I've never had that raw speed, you know, to, to fire off and be the fastest guy in the world. But I feel like, you know, over the course of a run, we kind of net zero and, you know, on a really long run, I feel like that's where I kind of excel. So, you know, this place fits in that that category for me i also love a non-typical racetracks right so the racetracks that i feel like i've run good at in the past have all been places like here where they're completely different one end to the other and your car is never ever going to be perfect you know on both ends so you know, i think for me um i don't know why this place has been a lot of fun um, i've had my fair share of bad days as well here uh don't get me wrong but uh, that first year especially was really good and We've had some good runs since then, so hopefully we can carry that into uh, into tomorrow. All right, we'll come up front to Mike. Mike Henry, Auto Week. I want to ask you about something else, but first we have to know more about this vocabulary difference. Have, have you learned how to had, had to learn how to say dude or or something? Um, else? not dude, because uh, I feel like that's more uh, like I would have said dude probably when I was younger. Maybe I don't know. Um, just very i don't even know how to explain it very different um have you have you well i mean noah did the 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 gritty in um where did he win at uh talladega right he did the gritty in in uh victory lane i'm not gonna lie i had to figure out what the dance was because i didn't know what it was um so that's my fault but uh just very different you know i don't know uh and, and you make references a lot of times like i'll say something or make a reference to something and they're like i got no idea what you're talking about and to me it's not that far removed but to them i mean here we we were just laughing because um you know days of thunder i remember when it came out and i was super excited when it came out it's like the greatest movie in the world and Noah was like yeah i was however old he was whenever like when he was born, the movie was however many old years old. Like he, he had to wait until he was older to even watch the movie. And I'm like, yeah, that makes me feel a little bit older. But you know, I guess with all generations, things like, you know, my dad tells me about stories about different things that I can't relate to. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of like grandpa at the shop. It's okay. Darlington is often hot and slippery. Uh, the forecast is kind of relatively cool. Is that going to make a significant difference or not? Have you ever been to Darlington? Yes. Okay. Forecast is what it is, but if it's if the sun might be out tomorrow, I'm pretty sure it's going to be hot. This is the one place in the world, I don't know what it is, but it just seems like – it just seems like – and I was joking, by the way, on whether you've been here or not, but I just feel like I've never come here and not sweated my butt off. It just seems like even when the sun goes down, it can be – it can be still super hot here. Um, you know, this – you know, our race especially. I mean, we start in the middle of the day when potentially could be the hottest, right? I mean, I know that the forecast looks overcast and, and maybe on the cooler side, but I just feel like if the sun pops out at any given moment, it's going to be very, very slippery and very, very hot. I am curious. You know, obviously right now outside, it's it's fairly windy and, and really overcast. The, the, the temperatures, just since I've gotten here, has probably dropped 10, 15 degrees. You know, so we're going to go out there and practice here in just a little bit. We're going to qualify. I have a feeling conditions have potential to be a lot different than what we see tomorrow afternoon. So I am a little bit leery of that because, you know, it's really easy to get baited into a balance here. And then, you know, once the sun comes out, I mean, we've even seen in the race where you can have a shade for two or three laps and immediately your balance changes for those two or three laps and the sun comes back out and you're right back to where you were at. So, you know, I think for us managing that's going to be interesting, but um, if it is cool, I think that will help. Um, because I think that it's going to allow, especially in turn three and four, I think it's going to allow for some, some movement, get some guys to drop down. We've seen some races where the guys have been able to drop down a little bit lower, um, and not have to run the wall. So I think you're, you know, if you open that second lane up, that obviously makes a big difference for this race. But, but even furthermore, I think when you get to turn one and two, um, can you enter one and two side by side? Can you get off of turn two now with the, the, the new asphalt patch side by side? You know, those are all questions that when it's hot and slippery the answer is no because you're you're doing everything you can do to kind of hang on to your own car let alone being side by side with somebody but if it is a little bit cooler and you've got that ability to race a little bit more side by side um that could potentially open up a lot of a lot of doors that may not have normally been open but it also opens you up to be crashed really easy so you know i think it's going to be interesting to see what tomorrow holds for sure i assume it's gonna be hot though i'm just 
history serves me well. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be warm. All right. You mean, okay. We'll go up front to Dustin here. <clears throat> Justin Long, NBC Sports. Justin, um, we're about a month out from Portland from the, the uh, race there. Is that something that you started working on or, or thinking about, or is that still too early in, in the process because that's a new track? How, how do you look at that, and, and can you explain kind of the process you'll go to prepare for that? I've been around Portland in sim, sim world, right? Never been to Portland in real life. Um, but I think it's probably still a little bit early. You know, I think that for us, you know, what's interesting about what's interesting about our sport right now is the level of competition and you know, every week being so competitive. You're crazy if you think you can bypass a week of just trying to prepare yourself for that that upcoming race to move to something in the future. Um, I think it's really easy to focus in on the racetracks you enjoy. But when you don't necessarily look forward to a certain race or, or type of racetrack, it's really easy to kind of look ahead and say, okay, well, what's what's another race in the future that, that I might look at? And and I think you end up baiting yourself into to not being prepared for that next one. So for me, um, I've kind of taken it week by week. Okay, how do I be prepared for the next one? The most important one is always the next one, right? And your favorite race better be the next one, whatever racetrack it is, because if not, um, you, you're taking yourself and your team out of a chance to go win, I believe. Um, so for me, you know, Portland is is – I've tried to get an understanding of it. I've been around it. Like I said, in SimWorld, I, I understand where the corners are at. I've looked at track maps of it and things like that. But until we get to probably the week of, uh, I'm going to focus on the other races, and then when we get to the week of, that's when I'm going to dive in super deep and try to figure out um, you know, what I can do to be better. All right. Any final questions for Justin? <clears throat> okay. We'll take one from Kelly. KellyCrandallRacer.com. Justin, I just need to know how much crap you got from the DBC guys for coming up one spot short last weekend. So I don't know if you saw any of the – did you listen to DBC this week? I didn't know – I mean, Freddie kind of screwed me over on the deal by handing his keys off to the guy that ended up winning the race. So for those of you that didn't listen to uh, Doorbell McClure this week, um, so Freddie actually w rode with Jason Jarrett because they're, they're spotters together at, at 23-11, I guess, right, on, the, on Sundays. And they rode together. And uh, when we got down towards the end of the race, Freddie actually went down and handed Jason the keys to the rental car because if we won the race, he wanted to be in victory lane with his car. What he didn't know is, is that Jason was spotting for Josh Berry. So then the race gets over, and he's got to go ask for his keys back so that he can take the car so that Jason Derrick can go to victory lane. So I feel like I kind of got screwed over in the deal a little bit. But um, it was cool to see – it was cool to see a podcast get to the point where they have the ability to be on a race car and to see kind of their growth as a sport. I mean, everybody in the media works tirelessly to captivate our audiences as, as race fans, right? And and I think that with today's day and time, it is there's a lot to consume from from a, you know from a fan, whether that's about our sport or just life in general. And so to see you know. Everybody that's put in the effort and the time to, to kind of you know give our fans more information and more time and and, and more uh, ammo against drivers in some capacities, right? Uh, it, it's been a lot of fun, and, and so with them being on the car, you know, I didn't know I got done with the race, and I'm like, I don't even know if they're going to be happy with me running second or not. I didn't know what to think, and they all three gave me a spot on for the week, uh, so I feel like that's that's a plus. Um, and nobody got called to the NASCAR hauler in the process, so I feel like we 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 won. Like I mean, if nothing else in that capacity, we won. So it was good. Dale did say he wanted me to win for the haters, and uh, it's funny because I don't know if the DBC guys ever really know if Dale likes them or not. Like they always kind of wonder, like, does Dale actually like our podcast or not? And so I think that was a little bit of validation for them that hey, that uh, he's at least paying attention and he really enjoys it, but. Mike Davis, I've never gotten an answer from whether he was happy that I didn't win or not. But I feel like since we won at JRM, it kind of maybe eased the blow a little bit, you know. And it's not like we lost on the last lap, last corner pass. So maybe it's a little bit better. I don't know. We'll just have to convince them to sponsor you again. I, that's what I told him. I said, if you want to do it again, I will have another shot at it. So <laughs> they did arguably take my best racetrack in the sport. So it's hard to – it's hard to, like – if they go somewhere else, the results probably aren't going to be quite as good. Let's just put it that way. <laughs>
All right, and then one final question for you before you wrap up. The real question is, did Harper know what the gritty was? Even Harper did not. did not. No, she did not either. So I feel like I did um, – so Blake Cook, that obviously is a friend of mine, used to be in the sport, his, his son Carter uh, plays football, and um, he – was devastated that I didn't know what the gritty was and he thought that that would be what my victory lane celebration should have been anyway. So, you know, I, I have gray hair for a reason and, uh, I, you know, I don't really have a whole lot of free time with a little baby in the house. So yeah, needless to say, it's, uh, I'm not keeping up on current, current times. Well, between Carter or Noah, someone can definitely teach Somebody you. Somebody can teach me how to teach do you it. what the gritty is. So. I can't dance. So I'm pretty sure not that that's really a dance, but like I have no, hand-eye coordination to dance, so I don't think they're going to be able to teach me either. Well, I mean, I could probably throw ears of corn. Uh, we could probably chuck some ears of corn in the grandstands, although we'd probably hit somebody. And that wouldn't be good. So we probably, <laughs> probably ought to refrain from that, but uh, yeah. I'm at least glad to see that the agriculture side of things is, is definitely uh, going good whenever he wins, so that's good. <laughs> All right, Justin, thanks for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it.